start the first chapter uh, of this class. So, chapter 21 is about capital budgeting and evaluation with, with leverage. So basically, we will talk about several uh, methods of valuation. The first thing is we would use this WAC method. Oops. And then we will present you this adjusted present value method. And third, we will use flow to equity method. And then we will talk about some more details with respect to these methods. Okay, so let's start. First, to make things simple, we want to make some initial assumptions. These assumptions are like this. First, we assume the market risk of the, uh, of the project is the same as the market risk of the firm. Um, why do we need this kind of assumption? Well, obviously it's for simplicity, but the reason is it's relatively easier to calculate the market risk of the firm. And generally, you can imagine that individual project will have different risk compared with the risk of the firm. So by making this assumption, we can pretty much use the cost of capital for this firm as the cost of capital for this project, right? So it really simplifies things. Second, we assume the firm's debt equity ratio is constant. And you can see that again, this really makes our life easier. Think about valuation, right? If you want to value a set of cash flows, then you have to think about what kind of cost of capital for those cash flows. And in this case, if the project's debt equity ratio changes, then it basically means the cost of capital will change, right? Think about cost of capital. If you use WAC as the cost of capital, then the formula for WAC is debt divided by the firm's value times the uh, cost of debt, one minus corporate tax rate plus equity divided by firm's value times the cost of equity. So you can see that if you have these weights, that is, if you have the debt equity ratio change, then you will have a changing whack. This will make your valuation much harder. And the third assumption says, corporate taxes are the only imperfections. So we will not consider personal taxes. We will not consider insurance costs, and we will not consider financial distress costs, and we will not consider agency costs. Um, again, this is not realistic, but it's good simplification. And later in the chapter, we will actually re relax these assumptions, and then we will uh, consider more generated, and we will consider more general cases. Okay, now let's talk about the first method, which is the WAC method, the weighted average cost of capital method. So why do we call this as the WAC method? Well, it's really because we will use WAC as the discount factor. Um, first, the definition of WAC. So you guys have learned about this in corporate finance too. The calculation of WAC is really the weighted cost of capital of both um, debt cost and equity cost, right? So this guy is essentially the weight of equity. And this guy is essentially the weight of debt. And then you use the weight of equity times the cost of equity. And then you use the weight of debt times the after-tax cost of debt. And this will give you WAC. And given WAC, the valuation will become easy, right? So basically, um, the value of, a, of the investment or the value of the project 
will be the discounted will be the value of the discounted cash flows. And to be more specific, you can see that you will want to use WAC to discount free cash flow from this project. Right? Or uh, if you draw the timeline, so basically this would be the value at time zero. And then you will look at these cash flows. And then you will use the discount factor, which is WAC. Now let's look at a specific example and see how could we use the WAC method. So assume the firm Avco or Avco is thinking about introducing a new product. Let's call this product as the RFX series. Um, we assume the product only has a life of four years. And the firm expects a sales of $60 million per year over the next four years. And manufacturing costs and operating expenses are expected to be $25 and $9 million per year. And the upfront R&D and marketing expenses are $6.67 .6 million the invest in equipment is $24 million. So this is essentially CapEx, capital expenditure. And there are no networking capital requirement for the project. And corporate tax rate is 40%. Okay. Now, as you could imagine, if you want to use the WAC method, you have to need, I mean, at the very basic level, you need two things. The first is cash flows. The second is WAC. So we will now solve the first problem. That is, how could we find out the firm's cash flows? Generally, in Corporate Finance 1 or Corporate Finance 2, uh, the problem will actually tell you what are these cash flows. And in advanced Corporate Finance, you have to find out these cash flows yourself from the financial statements. So here you can see that um, we have these five years financial statements, right? And our goal here is to find out what is the free cash flow of this project. Of course, now you have to know some accounting, um, e uh, some basic accounting equations, right? So we would go from sales. Yeah, maybe let's focus on this column, right? Let's focus on year one. So you will go from sales. Again, this $60 million of sales is given by the problem. And then you will minus the cogs cost of goods sold. This gives you gross profit. And then you would minus operating expense and depreciation. This gives you EBIT. And then you will consider the corporate tax, which gives you the unlevered net income. Uh, this is not net income. This is actually unlevered net income. Because you can see that here, will not deduct interest payment or interest expense from EBIT. So this net income is unlevered. And then this gives us unlevered net income. And next, we will think about how do we adjust from the unlevered net income to free cash flow. 
Um, basically, you can see what you will do is you have to first add back depreciation right? because um, for depreciation, there is no actual cash flow. So you have to add it back. And then you have to minus the capex because there is actual cash flow, sorry, because there is actual cash outflow. So you have to minus capex. And then you have to minus the change in net working capital. We have not formally talked about net working capital uh, to, uh, in this class yet. But the intuition here is, if there is an increase in net working capital, then it basically means you tie up more cash in your working capital. So you have to minus the increase in net working capital. And then you can see that uh, we can basically find out this firm's free cash flow. So um, yeah, let's just go from the unlevered net income. So first year, and we have this minus four here, and then minus this uh, capex of twenty-four million dollars, so we get this minus twenty-eight, and then for the second year, uh, we go from the twelve dollars on average net income, and then plus depreciation, so we get eighteen. Then basically, you can see that we now have found out. The uh, the four years cash flows. So we have found out the cash flows. Now we want to find out how to calculate this firm's WAC. Uh, remember what is the definition of WAC, right? So it's it's the weight of equity times the cost of equity plus the weight of debt times the after tax of debt. Sorry, the after tax cost of debt. And now you can see that um, the the value of E equity is three hundred. Now, what is D here? Well, you might say it's. 320 but don't forget we have cash here so the debt here is actually 320 minus 20 right or you could say we're essentially talking about net debt here and then you can see that WAC is 1 over 2 times the cost of equity which is given Six per, uh, ten percent plus one over two times the cost of debt, which is six percent, and then we want to use the after tax cost of debt, so one minus forty percent. So this gives us six point eight percent. So, by the way, if you don't have these numbers, right? How do you find out the cost of debt and equity? Well, generally you will use CAPM. Okay, now after getting cash flows and WAC, it's time for us to find out this project's present value. So if you look at timeline here, then you would know that the purpose is you want to find out this project's value at date zero. And then you have these cash flows, minus 28, 18, 18, 18, and 18. And then you have whack at these four dates, which are given by 6.8%, 6.8%, Six eight six point eight percent and six point eight percent. And after getting these numbers, you could just discount these cash flows with the six point eight percent whack, right?
So it's pretty easy here. And the value of this project is $61.25 million. And we know that the cost of the project is $28 million. So the NPV of this project is the difference between these two numbers, which is $33.25 million. Okay, now let's summarize the WAC method. There are three basic steps. First, you want to find out this project's or this firm's free cash flows. Of course, you do this by looking at this firm's financial statements. And then you will compute the WAC. The little caveat here is when the firm has cash, you will want to use net debt. And the third step is you will value this investment or this project by discounting these cash flows using WAC. Now let's see a very simple example. So let's suppose AVCO is making a acquisition. So oops. Oops. Ah, sorry. So AVCO is making a acquisition of another firm. So let's say generate additional cash flow of $3.8 million in the first year. And the growth rate of this cash flow would be constant, which is 3% per year. And we assume the cost of the purchase is $80 million. And we further assume Avco will adjust its capital structure to maintain its current debt equity ratio. So, it, so its current debt equity ratio is, uh, is just one. And if the acquisition has similar risk to the rest of AFCO, what is the value of this deal? First, um, you can see that most likely you will use the uh, constant growth model to value this acquisition, right? because you have the first year cash flow and you have this constant 3% growth rate. Now, the only number you need is uh, the discount factor. So here you can see that the problem tells you Avco will adjust its capital structure to maintain its current debt equity ratio. This means Avco's WAC should stay same, which is 6.8%. And then the problem also assumes the acquisition has similar risk as Avco, which means we could use Avco's WAC as the projects or the acquisition's WAC. So the discount factor for this acquisition is 6.8%. So basically the value of this acquisition would be uh, first year's cash flow discounted by 6.8%, minus um, the growth rate, 3%, which is uh, 100, yeah, it's 100. And then the cost of this purchase is $80 million. So you can see that MPV is $20 million, okay? So you can see that this is a very uh, easy, simple application of the WAC method. Okay, now let's talk about implementation. So you can see that the very crucial assumption of the WAC method is you want to assume the WAC is constant. To get a constant WAC, at least you will want the firm's debt equity ratio to stay constant. Again, let's think about this problem in the context of the AVCO example. So by undertaking this RFX project, AVCO will add $61.25 million to its assets, right? So what is this number? This number, 61.25, is just the present value of this project. And we know that the firm wants to maintain 
the debt to equity ratio at one, which means if the firm's value increases by $61.25 million, then AFCO has to increase its debt, right? Because if the debt to equity ratio is one, then the debt to value ratio is one over two. That is, if D versus E equals to one, then D versus E plus D equals one over two. So you can see that if value, here value is, is essentially D plus E. So if value increases by $61.25 million, and if you want to maintain this debt to value ratio of one over two, then debt has to increase 61 to five times 50%, which is 30.6 to $5 million, right? Now let's see how could we implement this. Um, maybe this would be easier if we look at this firm's um, balance sheet. Okay, so let me... Okay, I don't really know how to use Excel on an iPad. Okay, let me see. Oops. Ah. Uh, oops. Okay, so... Okay, where's the file? Oh. Okay, I think that this is the file. Okay, great. Um, so do we have the balance sheet here? Ah, sorry guys. We don't have the balance sheet. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so let's go back to the lecture notes and see the balance sheet. So what you can see here is um, the firm, right? The firm initially, before taking this RFX project, it had $20 million of cash, right? They had $20 million of cash. And we know that the firm's debt has to increase by 60, uh, point two, uh, point six to five million dollars. So what the firm will actually want to do is it will first spend the $20 million of cash and then it will borrow additional $10.625 million, right? And what is the project's cost? Well, the project will only cost about $28 million. So this means this firm will have some additional unused cash. So after making the investment, the firm will have $2.625 million, right? And then what the firm will do is the firm needs to pay out this amount of cash to its shareholders to maintain this uh, constant debt equity ratio. Okay, uh, that is confusing enough. So let's look at these two, um, these two marked value balance sheets and hope these Two tables will make things easier to understand. As I said in the beginning, you can see that the firm had cash $20 million. And we know that the firm has to increase its debt from 300. Again, the debt is actually 300 because you have to think about net debt, right? So 300 essentially is uh, 320 minus 20. We learned that the firm has to increase its debt from 300 to 330.625. But we know that 
the firm will only need $28 million, right? So you can see that in the end, the firm will need to pay out $2.62 million. And now let's see what is the firm's market value balance sheets after uh, the project and after adjusting its value, sorry, and after adjusting its debt to equity ratio. So you can see that existing assets stay the same, $600 million. And the value increase from the RFX project is $61.250 million. So the total asset would be six hundred and uh, sorry, six hundred and sixty-one point two five million dollars, and the debt is given by this. So obviously the equity would be just six six one point two five zero minus debt. minus that so you can see that now again we have to now we have uh, six successfully maintained the same the constant debt equity ratio right you can see that previously the debt equity ratio is 300 versus 300 which is one now it's still the same right Again, you can see that the process works like this. We find out what is the firm's value after the project. Right? We get this number. And we use this number times 50%. Then we could find out the value of debt. Right? And then we compare the increase in, in debt versus the, 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 the cost of this project. We find out that the firm will actually have this residual cash, $2.625 million. And this firm will pay out this amount of cash to two shareholders, possibly in the form of a dividend. So that's why you get zero cash here. And then you can see that the market value of Avco's equity right increases from 300 to 330 point six two five million dollars right so that's the increase in the equity that is if you compare these two numbers 300 versus this you can see that there is an increase of 60 point six two five Remember that these shareholders, they also have got this $2.625 million of special dividend. So in this case, you can see that the value increase for the shareholders is, um, I don't know what's the number here. I think it's, so let me see. So the number is 30.625 plus 2.625, which is, 33.25 million dollars and you can see that this number is exactly the MPV of this project again you can see that the value increase from the shareholders perspective perspective has two components the first is the increase in the value of equity the second is the additional cash paid out by the firm to the shareholders, right? You add up these two components, then you will find out the total shareholders gain, okay? Okay, um, now what I can see that, we know that in the beginning, the firm AFCO will increase its debt uh, by spending its $20 million of cash and borrowing this additional $10.625 million. That's just the firm's design. 
in the first year? What about the second year, the third year, and the fourth year? Well, to understand this, we will first talk about debt capacity. So first, the definition. Debt capacity is the amount of debt at a particular date which is required to maintain the firm's debt-to-value ratio. So, in terms of mathematical calculation, it is actually very easy. So, let's say we have a timeline like this. And let's say this is date T. And let's assume the firm wants to maintain a debt-to-value ratio of D. And let's also assume that the firm's value at date T is given by VLT. And you can see that the debt which is required to maintain the debt to value ratio is given by D times VLT, right? I mean, this is like really obvious because date T's debt divided by date T's value equals D. Of course, this will satisfy this debt to value ratio requirement. Now, the question is, how do you calculate VLT? Well, um, to calculate VLT, you can actually, again, look at this timeline here. So let's say this is T. This is T plus 1, T plus 2. You want to find out the firm or the project's leverage value at time t. So let's say you're looking forward, you're looking into the future, and you have these two data points. That is, you have the free cash flow at time t plus 1, and you also have this firm's leverage value in this future date. That is, the firm's leverage value at date t plus 1. In this case, you can see that if you have these two values, and if I ask you, what is this guy? What is, this, what is the firm's leverage value at date t? Then you will see that it's pretty easy, right? You would just basically discount these two values. You would just discount this free cash flow at t plus 1 and the firm's leverage value at t plus 1. And by discounting these two numbers, you will get the firm's value at time t. That is, VTL equals FCF t plus 1 times leverage value at t plus 1 divided by the firm's whack. Okay. As I said, um, we have to find out, we have found out the firm's debt capacity at year zero, right? We have calculated the firm's leverage value is 61.25 and the firm wants to maintain a debt value ratio of 50%. So we find out uh, this number is 30.2, uh, sorry, 30.625, right? We have found out this number. And I said our further questions were how do we find out these additional numbers, right? What amount of debt the firm needs to use? at year one to year four. Well, you can see that, you can see that this is not hard. What you will do is, you will want to find out the firm's leverage value at each date. And then you use this leverage value at each date to find out this firm's debt capacity at each date. So let's see how this works. Again, you want to use this uh, timeline because it really makes things 
easier to understand. Okay, let me draw a larger timeline. Okay. Uh, remember the discount factor is 6.8%. So we know that at uh, year four or date four, no, year four, the free cash flow is $80 million. So now your question is, you want to find out the debt um, capacity at the third or in third year. How do you find out this? Well, what you're gonna do is you will find out the firm's leverage value at the end of the third year. Well, this is easy, right? You will pretty much discount the free cash flow in the fourth year by one plus six, eight percent. Now, what is the free cash flow in the fourth year? Well, we have solved this. It's $80 million. So this gives us 6.85. And then we know that the debt capacity should be given by uh, the ratio times the firm's leverage value. And the ratio here is 50%. So the debt capacity at the end of the th third year would be given by the leverage value times 50%. So this gives us 8.34. Right? So, oops. So you can see that. Uh, oops. So you can see that um, the value here is 16.85 and the debt here is half of this number, 8.43, right? So now let's uh, do one more example. So let's say you want to find out the debt at, I mean, uh, at the end of the second year. What you will want to do here is, again, you will try to find out the leverage value for the second year which is given by the free cash flow in the second, uh, sorry, which is given by the, 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 the free cash flow in the third year plus the firm's leverage value in the third year, discounted by the 6.8% WAC. So this would give you a number of 32.8%. 6.3, right? And then debt is really just half of this value. So it's 16.32. So this means uh, V here is given by 32.3 and D here is half of that, right? Okay. So essentially the process is you will discount the fourth year cash flow and this will give you the third year value and 50% of that will give you the debt capacity. And then you will discount the third year numbers that is the free cash flow and the value in the third year, and then you would go back one period. This gives you the second year's leverage value. And 50% of that will give you the debt you need. And you will continue to do so, that is using two numbers from the second year, discounted with the 6.8% uh, discount rate, you get this number. And again, you have this number. And then you will discount these two numbers in the first year and go back one period. You will have the initial value, 
which is 61.25. And 50% of that, this gives you the debt capacity, right? So it's pretty easy once you understand it. Okay, now let's look at the example here. Um, debt capacity for the acquisition. So it's the continuation of the last example. Remember that in the last example, we said the firm Avco wants to uh, make this acquisition of a different firm. So suppose Avco proceeds with the acquisition described in the last example. How much debt must Avco use to finance this acquisition? and maintain its debt to value ratio. How much of the acquisition must be financed with equity? Okay, now let's solve this. Um, let's recall the numbers we got in the last example. So we know the project, sorry, we know the acquired firm has a value of $100 million. And we also know that the cost of the acquisition is $80 million. Now, think about this. So basically, if Avco acquires this project, then Avco's value will increase by $100 million. And we know that the firm wants to maintain a debt-to-value ratio of 50%. So this implies um, it will have to use a debt of $50 million, right? And the cost of the project is $80 million. This means the firm will need to finance its acquisition with $30 million of equity, right? So now you can see that the answer is it will use um, it will use it will use thirty million dollars of of equity, and it will increase its debt by fifty million dollars. Let's see the second valuation method. It's called adjusted present value. If you look at this formula, you will quickly see why this is called an adjusted present value, right? So basically the approach works like this. First, you will calculate the unlevered value, and then you will add back the present value of interest tax shield. And the sum of these two numbers will give you the firm's levered value. So this one is pretty similar to what you have learned from corporate finance too, right? Remember that in corporate finance too, when you try to think about a firm's levered value, this is exactly what you would do, right? You would first look for the unlevered value. Then you will calculate the present value of the interest tax the shield. Then the sum of these two components will give you the firm's levered value. So it's really a, uh, I would say it's a really a more detailed version uh, of what you have learned from corporate finance to valuation. Okay, now um, how do you really find out the firm's unlevered value? But when you're thinking about unlevered value, you will use a different discount factor, right? If you're thinking about levered value, you will discount it with WAC. And if you think about unlevered value, you will discount cash flows with unlevered cost of capital or the firm's pre-tax WAC because unlevered cost of capital is the same thing as the pre-tax WAC. So 
Obviously, the first step is to find out the firm's unleveraged cost of capital, right? So you can see that um, this formula tells us how to calculate unleveraged cost of capital. And we're using the notation RU here. This U essentially refers to this cost of capital is unlevered. And as I said, unlevered cost of capital is the same thing as pre-tax whack. Okay, now let's go back to the AFCO example. Um, so first, let's calculate AFCO's unlevered cost of capital. So remember that we know that the firm's debt to value ratio is always 50%. And we also know that the firm's cost of equity is given 10%. And its cost of debt is also given 6%. So you can see that RU would be pretty much the debt value ratio times the debt cost of capital plus equity value ratio times equity cost of capital. And this gives us 8%. And then we also learned um, the firm's, sorry, and we also learned the cash flow of this project. It's, uh, oops. So it's uh, minus 28, which is the initial cost of the project. And then the project will generate these four cash flows because the life the because the life of the project is just four years. So to calculate the unlevered value of this project, you would essentially discount these four cash flows with this eight percent pre-tax whack, right? So this is exactly what is happening in this, for, in this calculation. And this will give you a unlevered value of $50.62 million. So that's essentially the first step, calculating the unlevered value. And then you will think about how do you find out the present value of the interest tax shield. So now we will have to go back to sort of this Corporate Finance 2 thing, right? About interest tax shield. Okay. First, how do you calculate interest tax shield? So remember that interest tax shield equals the corporate tax rate times interest payment and what is interest payment well this is easy right it's just interest rate times debt but here if you think about how to exactly calculate interest payment then you will see that there is this timeline issue the reason is because now we're having four years, right? Every year, we will have a certain amount of debt. And every year, the firm will need to pay out interest payment. So you can see that to correctly calculate interest payment, if you think about the timeline, then the interest rate will calculate it as this. So let's say you have a debt D0 at date zero and at day one you have d1 d2 d3 and d4 now we will assume that the interest rate will be paid at the end of the year so essentially it means that at date zero if you have if you have oops ah oh, gosh so at date zero, if you have this, um, this amount of debt, then date one's interest payment is given by 
RT times D0. Again, if at date 1 you have a dead level of D1, then date 2's interest is D1, sorry, is RD times D1. So this is under, I mean, this is quite intuitive to understand. Just think about this debt as a corporate bond which pays annual coupon payment. And you can, uh, and you can assume the annual coupon payment will be paid at the end of the year, right? Okay, now we can first calculate uh, the firm's interest to tax the shield. As I said, you have to be careful with the timeline issue. So here you can see that the initial debt is $30.62 million. And then you will have to calculate the interest uh, payment, which is 3% times $60.62 million, which will give you this number. And then the interest tax shield would be given by 40% times um, $1.84 million. So this will give you this number. Okay, let me uh, write, let me explicitly write these numbers. So to get 1.84, you would use 6% times the prior year's debt. This gives you 1.84. And to get 0.73, you would use the corporate tax rate times the interest payment, which gives you 0.73. Uh, of course, you could do the same thing with other years. For example, to get this number, you will pretty much use 6% uh, times 16.34, and then you will use 40% times this 0.98, you will get 0.39 as the interest to tax the shield. So basically you can see that to get, to calculate the present value of the interest to tax the shield, now we have achieved the first step, that is to exactly find out the interest tax shields over the four years, right? So essentially, if you again have the timeline, then we have this number here, this number here, this number here, and this number here. And our question is, what is the present value of the interest tax shield? Right? So after getting these four cash flows, the next number we want to have is the discount factor. So how should we discount these interest tax shield? Right? Your first answer, I guess, is hey, we should discount these interest tax shield using the debt cost of capital. Right? Because interest tax shield is calculated based on interest payment, which is based on the firm's debt. So maybe it's very intuitive to use the debt cost of capital to calculate the interest tax shield. Well, this kind of thinking is incorrect. If you're assuming a constant debt value ratio, then you should discount the interest tax shield using the firm's unlevered cost of capital. So, let me just tell you the result here. So we have a claim here, which says if the firm maintains a target leverage ratio, that is in this lecture, if the firm's debt to value ratio is constant, then its future interest tax to shields will have similar risk to the project's cash flow. So 
They should be discounted at the project's unlevered cost of capital. The, 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 the textbook appendix has some explanation on this, why this is true. But if you think about it, it's actually very easy to understand. Basically, it works like this. If your debt value ratio is constant, then it means your debt will have the same variation as the variation in your value. That is, if your value increases by 10%, then you have to increase your debt by 10% to maintain the constant debt to value ratio. If your debt has the same variation as this, as your values, sorry, if your debt has the same variation as your values variation, this implies the risk of your debt should be the same as the firm's unlevered value. So you should use the project's unlevered cost of capital as the discount factor to discount the firm's interest tax shields. Okay, now what is the firm's unlevered cost of capital? Well, we have calculated it, right? We have found out its unlevered cost of capital is 8%. And we have these four cash flows. So our task now is quite simple. We just use the 8% to, to discount these four cash flows, right? Which means we will have this number. So it's $1.63 million. Now, we have found out the firm's unlevered value, and we also have found out the firm's present value of the interest to tax the shields. So now, by adding up these two numbers, we will be able to figure out the firm's lever value, right? So it's uh, uh, $61.25 million. This number is the same as the number you got from using the WAC method, right? I mean, this is obvious because if you have a different number, then you are essentially in trouble. It means your calculation is incorrect. Okay. Good. Now let's see the um, another example. Oh, this example is actually quite interesting. It will help you to understand why you should use the unlevered cost of capital to discount interest tax shields. Okay. Suppose ABC Corp maintains a constant debt equity ratio of one. Right. So. Um, debt equity ratio is one. And the current total value of the firm is $100 million. So D plus E is $100 million. And its existing debt is riskless. Over the next month, news will come out that um, this news will either raise or lower this firm's value by 20%. How will ABC adjust its debt level? Is the risk of the interest tax shield the same as the risk of the firm? This is this problem is actually very easy to solve. So, uh, so we know that the firm's value could either increase or decrease by twenty percent, which means if uh, its value will be either. 120 or 80, right? Because its current level is 100. And if its value is uh, 120, then its debt should be 60, right? And if its value is 80, then its debt should be 40. And we know that the initial level of debt is 50, right? Now let's see this. If, 
if the firm's value increases by 20%, then debt will increase from 50 to 60, which means debt will increase by 20%. If value decreases by 20%, debt will decrease by will decrease from 50 to 40. So in this case, debt will decrease by 20%. Now, the important thing here is you can see that they have the same variation, right? An increase of 20% in value implies an increase, uh, sorry, a 20% increase in value imp uh, implies a 20% increase in debt and a 20% decrease in value implies a 20% decrease in debt. And we know that interest tax shield is proportional to debt. So this basically implies if value increases by 20%, the interest tax shield increases by 20%. If value increases by 20%, sorry, if value decreases by 20%, the, in the interest tax shield decreases by 20%. So again, we get this result, that is, the interest tax shield has the same variation as the firm's value. So this basically means the interest tax shield should have the same risk as the firm. That's why we should use the unlevered cost of capital as the discount factor to discount interest tax shields. Okay. Um, now, let's summarize the APV method. Again, a three-step process. First, we want to find out the U, that is, the firm or the project's unlevered value. Importantly, to find out this, you will discount cash flows using pre-tax WAC. And then we will find out the present value of the interest tax shield. Obviously, to find out this, you have to find out the expected interest tax shield in the future. And then you will discount these interest tax shields using the correct discount factor. Importantly, if the firm is maintaining a target or a constant debt to value ratio, you should discount these interest tax shields using unlevered cost of capital. And the third step is simple. You will just Add up the unlevered value um, of the firm and the present value of the interest tax shield. Then the sum will give you the levered value. So if you compare the APV method with the WAC method, then the most important um, Distinction is you can see that the the APV approach will actually give you the explicit measure of the interest tax shield, right? So when you calculating the firm's levered value using WAC method, you just bundle everything together. You will just get a single number. That is the firm's levered value. But if you use APV method, you will get two numbers you get both the unlevered value and the firm's value of interest tax shield. So you can see that APV method basically gives you a more detailed view on the firm's or the project's valuation because you get this explicit measure of the interest tax shield.